you do it almost for selfish reasons. It makes you feel so good to know you obeyed the Lord. Two souls we knew. We really believed their spirits were waiting and knew that we'd come and obey the Lord. They were waiting, waiting for us. You know, wouldn't give up their spirits before they saw us. We had another similar experience. We'll kind of skim over that. My father was unsafe for many years, and then he would go out with a group of men every Saturday night, and they'd play cards and have some beer. My father was not a drunkard, but you know, they just the guys would get together. My mother didn't like it, but then she was sweet to him. And one of the men that was there was a Charlie, and uh, I we had met him a couple times at big gatherings, but I really didn't know him at all. And my mother had told us, my father had, of course, passed away several years ago. And my mother had said to us that Charlie was in the veterans' hospital. He was in a coma and not expected to live. And she says, just pray for Charlie that he will be saved before he dies. Well, we did pray for Charlie. And we prayed, oh, Lord, save him and let somebody come to him with Jesus, never knowing it would be us. One day... Oh, a couple of weeks after that, he, uh, we were in the, Phil was in the garage, I was in the kitchen doing something, and suddenly the Lord said to me, you must go to the Veterans Hospital and see Charlie in Minneapolis. So I headed out the kitchen door, and just as I went down the back steps, Phil came out of the garage. And I was walking out the way, and the Lord had spoken to me that we should go and pray for him. Yeah. And I was going to the house to tell a friend we had to go out and pray for him. So we got so dressed, went right out to the hospital, we came up to the floor, and the nurse said, um... Uh, well, he's in that room over there, but she says there's no use to go in there. She didn't say he couldn't have visitors. She says he's in a coma. He doesn't respond to anything. And she left to take care of her duties, and there we were, all by ourselves. <laughs> and there's his room right there. <laughs> and so that's what we came for. We walked into his room. He's lying. It's, it looks like they made the bed right over him. So I leaned over to him because I knew... I recognized him after all these years, and I said, way down by his face, and his eyes were closed, of course, and I said, Charlie, I didn't know what to say, so I said, Charlie, do you know who this is? God is my witness. He opened his eyes and looked right straight up into my eyes. Do you know what he said? He says, yes. Yeah, yeah, you're for Fern, Ru Rudy's daughter. Can you imagine that? I mean, when I had seen him, I, I wasn't married. I was younger. I don't know if I was out of high school then. See, the Lord let us know that he was in his right mind and that he was thinking. It really, it really was quite a frightening experience to have a person, you know, we expect to talk to him that he's going to hear and, and the Spirit's going to work and we're going to leave, if nothing else. He opened his eyes and he spoke these words to us. And then Philip spoke to him and I, I leaned over and I hugged him and I kissed him on his cheeks. And I said, Charlie, we came to let you know how much God loves you and Jesus wants to come in your heart. Remember how you prayed yes. with him? Yes. Yes. Oh, it was so sweet. Quietly. And he wanted to respond so much, but we said, just be quiet. Don't exert yourself now. Just let Jesus come in. He's right here. He's coming into your heart right now. And you, inside of you, you just say, yes, Lord, I admit Jesus to my heart. And then he's there, and he is your Savior today. And the blood of Jesus completely cleanses away your sin, and you will be with the Father for eternity. And we left. And he passed away that night. We were at the right place at the right time. <laughs> it meant a lot to us. See, we learned to know the voice of our yes. Father that way. Yes, amen. I'm thinking about just recently, of course, we can tell you so many experiences, but uh, one of the dramatic things, it's one thing to go to a hospital and see people. It's another thing to move from Minnesota to Oklahoma. Now, we never, ever thought we'd do that. We liked our home in Minnesota. We liked the cold weather. We're used to skiing uh, cross-country at our age, and we swim a lot, and, you know, we're, we're northern people. So when we'd come south to Brother Hagen's in Ramah, we'd come down the freeway to Ramah and out the freeway to the motel and back and forth, and that was it. So when we were in Tulsa two years ago in the spring, we had been invited to come to be on a television program and we were going to the cleaners to pick up some cleaners. We are leaving the next day for Minneapolis. <clears throat> As we were worshiping the Lord in the car, remember what the Lord said to us? Yes, out of, out of my spirit, I, I heard myself say, you must move to Tulsa. 
you must move to Tulsa. You must move to Tulsa. And I looked at Fern. You said it out loud. Yes, yes, I just spoke it out loud. We, we were, had been just praising the Lord, and this is what came out of my spirit. And I looked at Fern, and she looked at me, and we knew we would have to move to Tulsa. Oh, I said to Phil, Phil, we have to move to Tulsa. <laughs> and he said, yes, we have to move to Tulsa. <laughs> oh, later when we told people we're moving to Tulsa, Minnesota, he said, we thought you never liked Tulsa. I said, well, we didn't know much about Tulsa. Anyway, we're not moving there because we like it. We're moving there because the Lord told us to. Now, now we're Okies. And we love it. We love it. We love the people of Oklahoma. They're real home Amen. people. Amen. But, like the Lord, I forget the days now. I think it was like a Saturday the Lord spoke to us. It was a Saturday. Uh, we were committed uh, for the Sunday with some services in Tulsa. And Monday morning, see, we had a little winter home, just a small little, instead of an apartment, we had been able to get a small home in Dallas we bought uh, through, well, that's another whole whole session on that house. We bought this little two-bedroom house there, and we paid $151 a month, P-I-T-I. It's a mortgage payments, interest, principal, and taxes. Everything came to one fifty one a month. Our, our bills, gas and electric, were hardly anything. We weren't there much, and of course we were never there in the summertime to use air conditioning. So 151 we could never rent an apartment for that. And then, of course, we could have our own things around. So we had that for seven winters in Dallas. We bought that little house uh, for $26,000. And it had a big 7% mortgage on it. And, and the Lord just provided us with enough money to make the down payment miraculously. Well, anyway. So seeing we were in Tulsa and so close to Dallas, and the Lord spoke just to move to Tulsa, we said, well, instead of heading back Monday morning for Minnesota, let's run down to Dallas, put the, ha the house in the hands of a, the real estate lady who was so sweet to us and told us of the house, and let her put it on the market, and we'll sell the house in Dallas, absolutely. And we imagined that we probably would sell the house in St. Paul, too. But first thing, we're down here, we're going to sell the house in, in Dallas. So we drove down Monday morning. We told Mabel on this side, and we told Gene on this side and his wife that we're going to be moving to Tulsa, and we're going to put the house for sale. Oh, they thought that was terrible, because they mow lawn for us, and the sweet people, Baptist people, just loved them. They couldn't do enough for us. We had wonderful fellowship with them. Well... That was Monday we got there. Tuesday morning, we're out in the backyard and we're breaking up some leaves and things. We had a pecan tree there and there were some leaves and we were getting it so it looked, you know, orderly and nice. And a lady came to the gate and she said, uh, Mabel told me that your house is for sale. And we said, yes. And she asked what it was and we told her. <gasps> oh, we told her a price <laughs> that the Lord had told us. And so we just said it, $65,000. And she says, may I see it? And we said, sure, just go in and look it over. And uh, and uh, see, you know, just you can open the closet doors. Oh, thank God I had everything in order. <laughs> we hadn't been there a lot. <laughs> and uh, so she went through the house, and about a half hour later, she came out in the backyard to us. I left her alone, and she said, well, she says, I'm a bilingual uh, teacher in the Dallas Public Schools, and this is my district. We we're kind of on the edge of a large Mexican settlement. And, um, and lovely Mexican people. We just loved them. And when we see them in the grocery store all the time. She said, I've been looking for, oh, about six weeks in this neighborhood for a house. And I've seen houses, but it's, when I hear of them, when I get to them, they're sold. And uh, she says, I want to buy your house. We said, oh. See, we had put a call in at the neighbor's phone for the realtor to come, but she hadn't showed up yet. And she said, uh, we said, oh, wonderful. Well, um, We'll have to, you'll have to draw papers and, uh, well, maybe we can help you do that or we don't know just what the next step would be. And we said, well, do you have money for a down payment? Plenty of money, she says. My uncle died two years ago and his estate was just settled. And I was the administrator and I inherited all of his wealth. She says, the money's sitting in the bank and you have it anytime you want to. <laughs> See, because I think we instantly obeyed the Lord. There he had it right ready for us. Now, if we would wondered, oh, sell your house and move. I don't know. It's a cute little house, neat and clean, and, and just what we like, and it's not big to take care of, and nice neighbors. We thought we'd be there the rest of our lives. We honestly did. But see, as soon as we obeyed the Lord, and when he tells you to do something, do it right away. Because see, 
He's prepared a need in the school teacher. He already planned the outcome. And he was able to position us yeah. so that yeah. he could get us there just at the right time where the whole thing would work. Mm -hmm. And that's the way God works. We're going to talk yes. about the ways of God today. He plans things. He prepares things. Yes. If he can only get me in the right position. Yes. Yes. Amen. If he can only get you to Amen. do that, that thing that <clears throat> you're to do. You're to forgive your neighbor for all those nasty things. I had to forgive a neighbor of mine many years ago. When every Monday morning we used to wash and put our wash out on the lines. Now you can date me. And every Monday morning she would start a fire with the dirtiest stuff in and smoke would blow all over the neighborhood. Oh, I didn't like that at all. And all, all the ladies in our neighborhood said, oh, why does she do that? That's terrible. We have to run out and take in our white clothes and there's all this soot blowing around. And I said, well, talk to her about it. And they said, no, we're not going to talk to her about it. I said, well, I'm not going to talk to her about it. Boy, I sure talked to myself about it. Whew. I sure did not like that woman. And every time I'd look at her house, I'd think, oh, you're such a bad person to do that. I don't like you at all. <laughs> I did. I went through that completely. I, I fell short of cursing her. <laughs> but, you know, the Lord had a deal with me about that, too. He had a deal with me. He had to put such a love in, in my heart for that woman that things just turned around. It hinged on me, not her. It all hinged on me. I was holding her back by, my, by myself. My attitude was holding her back. That's where we bind and loose people. See? We can loose people if we'll loose them from us. Or if we hold things, that binds them so they can't move. We pray for them and pray for them. It doesn't do any good to pray for them when you've got something against them in your heart. I'd pray for her too. I'd pray, Lord, help Mrs. Schoberg so that she doesn't. Lord, just, just impress her that she's to be nice now to us and not put out this smoke. That's what we're going to talk about today. <laughs> but you know, the atmosphere where the Lord ministers is found in Acts 13, the second verse. We'll be through shortly, we hope. <laughs> Acts 13, 2. Why don't you read that, honey? As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work unto which I have called them. Okay. In the Amplified it says, As they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said. That's the right atmosphere now to get the Lord to speak to you. Worshiping the Lord. Worshiping Him, praising Him, having a thankful attitude in your heart to the Lord, making melody in your heart to Him, singing unto Him. When you're by yourself or just in your own home, sing unto the Lord, make up songs, just make one. They don't have to rhyme. Sometimes I'm singing a song to the Lord and I can't think of, of the word that rhymes with what I had just said, but then another word comes, the Lord doesn't care. <laughs> he makes it rhyme anyway. <laughs> and so sing a song. That's the atmosphere that gets charged with the Holy Spirit and then he can speak to you. I know that uh, the Lord spoke to me. Well, Philip and I have tried to watch our diet but uh, we love, we're Scandinavians and we like coffee with something sweet. So we had said to each other, we promised each other, I promised him no matter how he begged me I would not make cake. <laughs> His favorite cake. And I promised myself that I absolutely wouldn't, even though I was hungry for cake, I just wouldn't, we would go without cake for two weeks. We could do that. That would be really a fast unto the Lord in that area. So it was going on the second week. It was almost the end of the second week. And it was a Saturday. And the Lord spoke to me in the kitchen. And he said to me these exact words. <laughs> I want you to make a cake. No, it was at the end of the first week. That's right, the end of the first week. I want you to make a cake. And I thought, oh, mm, how nice. I could just picture the cake. <laughs> and then I thought, oh, I better not, because we promised each other that we would not eat sweets. And then the Lord spoke to me again, and he said, I want you to make a great, big, huge cake. And while I was thinking of that, the Lord said, company's coming. Oh, I thought, well, I'll make a cake if company's coming. 
A lot of times, you know, you'll just feel to prepare something extra and somebody will come or you just happen to do this and somebody comes and there you've got it. Doesn't happen often, but it'll happen. So I thought, oh, companies come. Oh, man, I wants to make cake. But the Lord said he wanted me to make a, made, impress me, I was to get a big pan. Now, I've got a pan I've hardly ever used. It's about that wide and it's about that long. I don't remember why I ever bought it. I know I never made a cake in it. And um, so I got the pan out. Phil was in the garage in Tulsa. And uh, this happened about two years ago. And I thought, I better not tell him I'm going to make a cake. I'll just surprise him. So I got the recipe out. I, I, I baked from scratch. And I could see plainly my recipe for a, a two-layer cake would fill about maybe one-third of that pan. So I thought, I'll get three bowls out. And I measured the butter uh, in each bowl. And I measured the I made three batches for this thing. And I got in the pan, got it in the oven. It turned out just beautiful, just beautiful. He came in from the garage and he said, Oh, man, I know what you've made. you made my favorite cake. And so then I told him what the Lord had said to me. And he said, Well, good. Well, I'm glad you made the cake. Well, then the cake cooled and I said, Oh, Father, I said, Now I'll know if this is really you if the frosting turns out right. Because the frosting that we make for that cake, if you don't catch it just right, you don't even get it out of the pan. And if you start to spread down the cake, pretty soon you got just one pile. Or if you get down the cake, the minute you cut it, the whole top cracks. So I said, oh, Lord, if the frosting will turn out, then I'll know it's you. It turned out perfect. I got it out of the pan, got it all spread. It looked, it looked perfect. Well, there, and I didn't dare cut it. I didn't taste it. I just knew I shouldn't. If y'all came in, he never said one word about the cake. No company came to our house. Got late that night. I'd covered the cake up, it cooled, and I covered it up. And in the morning, I said to Philip, you know, Philip, I said, I have the, the Lord didn't spoke to you, have the a strangest feeling, I've never had this before, that I'm to take that cake to church. So he said, well, then, I'd take it to church. Are we going to taste it? And I said, no, no. Remember, we promised we wouldn't taste anything for two weeks. And I think I'm to take it to church. So we put it in the back seat of the car and went to church that morning. Can you think of something I'm leaving out? No. Hmm? It just was I said to Philip, oh, I said, you better carry it in. Oh, no, we better go and talk to Pastor first and check with him and see if it's all right. Because, I mean, you know, can't say you're always right. We didn't know the pastor that well. Lee Morgans, we didn't know him well, but, he, you know, we knew him. So we went in there, and he was right there in the office, and we said, I told him about this, and I said, do you think we should bring the cake in? And he said, sure, obey the Lord, just bring it right in. Do whatever the Lord tells you to. And I said, well, as far as I know, I'm to bring it into church. And I had already brought now a big stack of paper napkins and a knife. I had put those in there. I don't remember doing it, but I had done that. So we brought it in, and the platform is not very big. It just cuts across a little corner, and there's an organ like this, and it was flat across the top. And I set the, as we were speaking, I told the people what had happened. And all during the ride to church, it's about 20 miles, the Lord had been speaking to me quietly, saying, Company's coming, company's coming, company's coming. And so I, you know, I just didn't know, but I knew take it to church. Well, we ministered that morning. We had a wonderful time. I told the people, and I said, now, the Lord tells me company's coming. And anyway, that's Billy. She's coming in later tonight. And I had thought maybe if she would happen to be there that morning, she could take the cake home with her, because she always has a bunch of people to her house that are from any place that want need a place. So that didn't work out. She wasn't even in town. So I said, we're going to cut the cake. And a thought crossed my mind. I didn't dare say it. We could have communion with cake. You know, nothing says we have to have bread, but I didn't say that to the people. I, was, I didn't go that far. But I said, we're going to cut the cake and serve it. It's company's coming. And praise the Lord, I said, you're all company. You're company to us. So we cut the cake, and, and the lady helped me, and we put it down in a napkin. They came by one by one. And we even had, boy, had about a third of the cake left over. I wasn't sure how to cut it, you know, how far it would go. And just as we're through speaking, we had a glorious time. The pastor had left the, left the church, uh, left the meeting just temporarily, and he came in. 
And he came in with a man about, I'd say, maybe 40 years old, and uh, his little shorter wife, uh, about maybe 35, something like that, and three small children, I'd say about eight and maybe six, and then a baby that couldn't walk. I mean, such a baby that couldn't walk. And then another ma a grown man, probably around 45, something like that. And they came along the side of the church, and uh, the pastors, uh, we were just finishing up praising the Lord, so I gave the microphone to the pastor. And he said, the strangest thing has happened. He said, these folks have lost their farm in Nebraska. They're on their way to uh, Arizona. Their truck broke down just right in front of the church here. In fact, some of the fellows are out there now to see what they need. And you could tell from these people, they had lost everything. The children didn't have stockings on. It was a cold day. They had tennis where their little toes were almost peeking through the tennis. I had lightweight clothes on. We were all bundled up. I had a fur coat my mother gave me. I had a fur coat on that day. It was so cold. And he said, the truck broke down right in front of the church. And I've had them in the office. And he said, I just brought them in because they want to receive Jesus as Savior. And so he led them in front of the congregation to say, I take Jesus as my Savior. Then we took an offering for them. And then people said, oh, I'm going to run home. I've got clothes. I've got a box of clothes. I've been going to bring to church for a long time. I've got this. I've got that. We loaded them up, and they went on their way. Company came. We sent the rest of the cake with him. Amen. But wasn't that quite an experience to have? Hallelujah. 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 Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise yes. the Lord. Yes. Amen. Yes. You Hallelujah. See, the Lord knows the need. And for someone to drive up and just their, their truck to break down right in front of that place. Just when we were there. People say things, just it just happened. But things don't just happen. God arranges circumstances to meet people's need. God knew we were there. God knew we would minister to their need. And they received Jesus Christ as their Savior. And when they left there, they had a car that ran well. It had been well fixed, they had money in their pocket and they could get to Arizona to be with their people because they had lost everything back home. Everything. They might have looked poor to the world, but they were company to us. We yes. loved them. We lo now the Lord just did that to meet them. And we never did taste that cake. We were able to keep our commitment. for the did We did keep it, didn't we? And we did. Amen. Amen. Our time is getting away from us. We've got about four other thing, incidents that we wrote down we'd like to tell you about, but I think we, maybe we'll just wind it up with, with this one. <laughs> if you want. Oh, well. I'm thinking of other people. Uh, I'll just touch on this in business. We've had tremendous experience. The Lord led us to buy a bankrupt company. Who wants a bankrupt company? If they know how to run it and they can't make it go, I said to the man, you know, why, why should we want it? <laughs> We didn't want it. But the Lord finally got through to us that we should buy a company that was just going to be dissolved. And the, um, in the bank, in the company account, it had $6. And uh, we promised the Lord that we'd do exactly what he told us to. And we said, Father, we won't put one penny of our own money in it. We're not going to mortgage our house and go into business, this business. And other businesses. We're not mortgaging your house. It's your idea. And Father, if you want us, we're available. We'll do it. You supply whatever's needed. And we'll just carry out your orders. Now, that's the way to do it, I think. It proved out that way. The first morning we were in business, uh, as you know, my husband, I know much about business, but my husband prayed in the Spirit, and he would tell me every morning what was going to happen people that were going to come in. I was in the first morning sitting at the desk. We're on the fourth floor of a large building. Nobody knows we're there. I think part of their problem, they never, nobody knew the company was there. Didn't know we were there. And a man came in and walked right up to the desk, got out his billfold, and he began to count out $50 bills. And of course, I think he's in the wrong office. He belongs in the office next door. This is a drugstore uh, uh, office for a warehouse or something counting up $50 bills and so I said to him finally I said is there something I can help you with and he said uh, well he said my uncle died two years ago have you heard that phrase before 
He said, my uncle died two years ago, and I'm the administrator, and I'm settling up all his old bills today. And he said he owes you $600. <laughs> and I said, oh, what is his name? So I went in the back room where they got, you know, the record, red lines through all these names. Didn't pay, couldn't collect, impossible to collect, deadheads. And I found his name with a red line through it. Sure enough, he owed $600. He had owned it for, I don't know, three, four, five years. At the beginning of the day, we had $6, and at the end of the day, we had $606. And I wish we had the time to take a whole afternoon and tell you about our business experience. Amazing how the Lord operated that. It was just a front to, to talk to people about Jesus, get them saved, filled with the Spirit, know about the Lord. And, you know, the business, that's, you know, that's what business is. It's just something to make money to channel it. Channel it. And if the Lord knows you're honest, and if he can prove you're, that you're going to do it, and if you remain true, then he finds he can use you, and you'll be amazed where the money comes Amen. from. Amen. Well, what I'd like to tell you about, I'd like to tell them about me all day land. Do you think we don't have time? Just After um, a Secrets of Intercession was at Anaheim, California, uh, we were, uh, we had the Secrets of Intercession ended on a Saturday and we were tired. And then Sunday morning we had promised to minister in a church. Sunday evening we were going to go to a church where Billy Brim was going to speak and listen to her. So Sunday morning came, we were on the way to the church, got in this uh, Seventh-day Adventist church that the Word Church was using. And uh, as we came up to speak... It's about 11, 10, 30 in the morning, something like that. We stepped before the podium, fastened our mics, and as I looked up on this side of this long church, over way over to the left and toward the back, was a young man, in, you would say, of the drug culture. Long, stringy, dirty hair, leather jacket. Not, not that leather jackets are bad or anything like that, but, I mean, his whole dress was one of, of uh, to identify him with the drug culture. He had the... Um, um, what do you call the big chains and bracelets and everything about him looked that way just from what I could see from, from where I was he stood right up and he went right out the back door and as he did that and I'm standing here my husband's greeting the people and suddenly I become so ill that I know I'm going to spoil the whole platform area and I've never done that in my life. Once in a while I've been sick or I've eaten something that hasn't agreed with me, but I could never make myself do those things. Oh, I unfastened the mic and got it down here. And I headed for two doors at the side, uh, which I thought were open. They weren't. The pastor's wife came with me, walked way to the back of the church, praying I'd just make it. And I went to the ladies' room, relieved myself right away, and felt good. I rinsed my mouth out, felt like a million dollars. Boy, I felt like I always do. Came right back, I came to the podium, my husband was speaking, and I fastened on the microphone, and I knew I, I owed an explanation to the people. But as I was fastening the microphone, in came this young man, right through the doors, and sat down. And the Lord spoke to me, and he said, Drug nausea. Oh, I see. I experienced nausea so bad because he had drugs. So I said, uh, somebody here, and I, can, I could call you out, I said, is subject to drugs and the Lord wants to deliver you. And if you don't raise your hand and come, I'll come and get you. And I said, if there are others here that are subject to anything like that, or tobacco, or alcohol, or narcotics of any type, you come too, because the Lord is going to set you free this morning. I've never had an experience like that before, have we? He got, he was the first one, he got right up of his chair and came right, right down to the front, so right in front of us. <laughs> he got delivered. He got delivered. He got, he got delivered, and as will happen sometimes, he was slain in the power of the Spirit. We went right kneeled right down with him to continue praying with him and to continue to cast the spirits out of him. And then there were other people for tobacco and things like that that, that uh, we ministered to. And then we finished the uh, meeting and then we went on our way. Two weeks later, we were at a church in Tulsa visiting a 
and not speaking. We were just in the audience. And a lady came, the pastor's wife happened to be in Tulsa at that same meeting, and she came across the auditorium to talk to us, and she says, do you remember that young man Sunday morning? And we said, how could we ever forget it? <laughs> and she said, well, let me tell you what happened to him. The next day, he went and got his hair cut. He bought a suit. His folks had spent over $50,000 on different programs trying to get him off of drugs. They used up almost all the money they had, and nothing worked. And she said, he's, you'd never recognize him today. He's clean-shaven, he wears a business suit, and he's got a good job. <laughs> Most amazing thing you can ever believe. Those things happen. I'd like to tell about Melody. We had two minutes? I'll tell this just between the uh, hundred of us here today. We had not planned to minister that night at Mel. Well, we didn't know Melody Land. You know, it's a huge church. Anybody know how big it is? Got the big platform in the middle. Everybody from Hollywood goes there. It's right in Disneyland. And it's a spectacle. We had heard of it, what a big church it was. And they've got everything there. About 15 pastors. Well... We didn't know anything about it, but one of the, in one of the meetings, Brother um, Wilkerson, the past, the main head honcho there, he had sat next to Philip and asked him if he would If speak. we would come and speak on Sunday night. And I, I said, well, I said, Brother, let me pray about it. And uh, people said to us later, pray about it? Dan, wouldn't you just go? <laughs> um, as a young boy, I was born in a home where I only spoke Norwegian until I was seven years old. I haven't spoken it for 60 years. Sometimes I pray in the language and then I understand it, but I cannot speak it. I haven't used it. But I, uh, I've been praying in the Norwegian language and I've been praying about the, with a pencil you were writing and writing and writing. And as I spoke that out in the spirit, that was at Rhema at, at a seminar. We came to California and uh, as he sat by me and he said that we would like to have you come and speak on Sunday night, you and your wife, I said, I'll pray about it. And as I began to pray, I was sitting there, and he got out a tablet, and he began to write and write, and the Spirit spoke to me and says, it says, there's your writing, you're to go there. That's how the God dealt with me to say, and I spoke to him a little later, I said, yeah, brother, the Lord wants us to come to your church. Yeah. So we told him, yes, that we would be there Sunday night, with, and the slightest idea of anything we'd speak about. We, we study and prepare, but we're never just sure what the Lord wants to bring forth that time. And then he speaks to us. The closer we get to the meeting, the more he lets us know what we should share, different things. That's why we don't put out tapes, because what we think what applied to one wouldn't apply to the other, and so we don't do that. Well, anyway, we got there that night, and, and uh, it's huge, and we sat down. It's like this, and this. We sat down in the front row there, and the pastor sat next to us. We were getting ready, and the service has started, the music, and finally we go up about, I'd say, ten steps to the big platform to speak up here. And then the uh, people sit in big risers like this, and there's big balconies like that. They're all, it's at a kind of an angle thing. They had taken the offering, and they had left on the steps down here some big uh, uh, containers with their offering in. So... We get up to the platform, and the Lord spoke to me, and uh, I said to Philip, Oh, I think I'm supposed to start. I know what I'm to say. And he says, Go ahead. So the first words that came out of my mind, my mouth were, We're here to transact business for God tonight. I was so surprised to hear that. <laughs> and I said, Pastor, I said, Is it all right if we leave the offering receptacles here. He says, do anything you want to do. So I said to the people, and this is not planned at all, I said, now, this is going to be a different kind of a meeting. Uh, while we're speaking, it's not going to interrupt us one bit. When the Spirit moves on different ones of you, and He will move on you, and you will be coming down here and putting more money in the offering and other things. You will be contributed in the offering. If you don't come, it's going to hinder the service. So it won't distract us a bit. We will add to the meeting. You just feel free. He told us later there were five waves of people. They came, they came in waves, and they kept coming. They come up about two steps or lean over and put their money in. People came from all of that. While we were speaking, we had a wonderful time in the Spirit. 
That was one of the nights when we called forth some people and we laid hands on them with a pastor. And the Spirit was so manifested uh, for a visible manifestation right before their eyes. While the service was over, many things happened. People were delivered and so forth. Well, as soon as the service was over, he came to the platform and he said, I will guarantee you, he said, that the Halversons will be back here tomorrow night on Monday night. Don't you miss it. Well, we knew we were not going to be there Monday night. He hadn't asked us. We had to be back in Minneapolis. Absolutely. We could not be there. There wasn't any way we were going to change our plans. God had not told us to be there even the first night. Well, I don't know how we ever covered that up. But about a month, was it a month or six weeks later, we met him at Rama. Sometime later. Yeah. yeah. And he came to us and he said, uh, we were having coffee with some people afterwards. And he was there and he came over and he said, say, did you ever hear about that service? that you were in. He says, I didn't know you had a financial ministry. And we said, we don't. <laughs> he does. <laughs> we don't. And he said, well, let me tell you what happened. And he tells us the story. He said, our church was about to go under. We had to have a million dollars by the end of the week. We had met with our people and said, listen, we've overextended. We've got money and paid bills. But the people that own it want to take it over. The business people from Disneyland had, had given them mortgages and mortgages and mortgages, knowing if they couldn't pay, they'd have all that property and add it to Disneyland. And they were going under. We didn't know that, but many people around the country knew that. Uh, when we told the story to some people, they said, oh, we heard they were in desperate financial condition for months. Well, he said, and oh, and I remember telling the people, and during the week, you're going to find the Lord's going to move on you to come to church and put money in and, and give the church some more money. And he said, the offering that night was $36,000. And he said, by Saturday, we had more than a million dollars. We, we, they needed a lot more than that, though. But he said, if we had the million dollars by the Saturday, we at least could say that part and then work on the rest. And the whole church was saved. They still have it. The million dollars came in by that Saturday, and then in the weeks to come, the other financing uh, was so the church was saved. Wasn't that an amazing experience? Amazing. Yeah. Yeah.